excited. Church of World Kill is dismissed. We want to pray on to go back to school. Yes. Sister Kathy was sharing with us. You know, they're facing things that you and I never have to face. Yes. So if you will, bow your heads. We're going to pray over our children. Father God, I thank you and I praise you. We come with your phone grace. And Father God, you should suffer the little ones to come unto you. And Lord God, we lift them up before the throne of grace right now, Lord God. We ask, Father God, that you keep your hand of protection, your hedge of protection around about them, Father God. Protect their hearts, protect their eyes, protect what they hear, Father God. Protect them, Father God, from those around them who try to do harm to them, Father God. Protect them, Father God, from receiving false doctrine, false teaching, and lies and negativity. Thank you, Father God, for your angels being kept around about them to, to do warfare on their behalf and to minister to them, Father. I thank you for keeping them safely, Father God. Every day, let them go to, work, go to church, Father, and bring them home safely every day to their families. And I thank you, Father God. I thank you for touching our teachers' hearts and minds, Father God, and helping them to do the best of their ability, Father God, to teach those children like they would teach your own children, Father God, to have that desire, that hunger, and that compassion for them also, Father. And Lord, we just thank you again for these precious children. We thank you, Father God, for entrusting them to us. And we thank you, Father God, for keeping them protected as they go back to school. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. 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 Jesus. Amen. I'll too quiet this morning. Say, Jesus. 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 I'm going to shout out to those on Facebook and YouTube. We appreciate you being with us this morning. Appreciate your prayer and your support also. And church, we will continue to keep Richard and Josh and his family lifted up in prayer. Uh, they had a loss of a loved one in his family as well as what he's going through with his dad. And he can't be here like he'd like to be. So please keep them lifted up in prayer also. Amen? Amen. Also, I want to give a big thank you to our Sunday school teachers. Yes. You know, on Wednesday night, sometimes we may have one child. And Sister Julie or Sister Jeannie will get up and never go back there with that one child. And miss out on what everybody else is doing just to be there for those kids and stuff. So I'm going to anticipate Karen. She'll take the nursery and take the kids back there. So let's give them a very big old shout. And thank you. Yeah. Tomorrow night, I'm going to thank my deacons. They always have my back. They always take care of things. Jerry's always making sure the church is like it needs to be. I want to thank them. I want to, I want to thank our board members. I want to thank the the, 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 the people. Sister uh, Tessa, she decorates these bulletin boards and stuff and makes them look so nice for her. Yes. I want to appreciate her. And also, uh, on Saturday night, Justin has started recovery class again, church. If you know anyone that's going through an addiction, even if you just have to deal with people with addiction, you can come and learn what you have to go through and by from somebody that's done it. So be here and support him. He's been faithful. He went back there. Nobody showed up, so he got on live. I think he had 1,800 people watching or something like that. Yeah. So, hey, let's support him. Amen. Yeah. I want to thank everybody for making new life, new life. I know we got a lot of people out this morning, and I know there's holidays and this summertime and all that stuff, but I just want to tell you how much that really means to me. I'm, I really feel privileged and blessed to be your pastor. I thank God for another year. <laughs> Never thought I'd live past 40, but here I am 73. I thank God for it. Praise God. And please don't forget, we're going to have a birthday dinner in the back, so please come back, share some food, some fellowship. Let's just have a good time. Amen? Amen. We're going to do that right after services. All right. Let's hold for a Bible maker confession. Say it like you mean it, mean it like you say it. This is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. I have what it says I have. I have what it says I have. I can be what it says I can do. I can be what it says I can be. And I can do what it says I can do. I can do what it says I can do. My mind is alert. My mind is alert. My heart is perceptive. My heart is perceptive. I'm a winner. 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 I'm a doer. I'm a doer. I'm just a hearer. I'm a doer. I'm a doer. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Thank God for God. Jesus. I said, well, for the right crowd, so turn to somebody funny behind me next to you and say, Thank God. Thank God, you all. 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 Thank God, you all
birthday card, and uh, my wife picked this one out for me, and it said, and God said, let there be light, and lo, and behold, <laughs> a lot of light. Yeah. And then, Brother Gary, because I, I finally caught up with him, him and Tessa got this one for me, it says, Ice Age, Stone Age, Bronze Age, and then it has a mirror over here, it says, Old Age. <laughs> I'm always teasing everybody. I go to the bathroom in the morning, some old man jumps in front of me in front of a mirror. I don't know who he is. Jim kind of discovered that one. <laughs> if you will turn me to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. <laughs> As you turn there, the Bible says, me and Mark, good, good, like medicine. So I got you some medicine this morning. Remember, these are just humorous stories, so please don't be offended. These are some letters to a pastor from children. So, dear pastor, I'd like to go to heaven someday because I know my brother won't be there. Dear pastor, I know God loves everybody, but he never met my sister. <laughs> dear pastor, please say in your sermon that Peter Peterson had been a good boy all week. I'm Peter Peterson. <laughs> dear pastor, my father should be a minister. Every day he gives me a sermon about something. Dear pastor, I'm sorry I can't leave more money to play, but my father didn't give me a raise in my allowance. Could you have a sermon about a raise in my allowance? <laughs> Dear Pastor, my mother's very religious. She goes to play bingo at the church every week, even if she has a cold. Dear Pastor, I think a lot more people would come to your church if you moved it to Disneyland. Oh, gosh. Dear Pastor, I like your sermon where you said that good health is more important than money, and I still want a raise in my allowance. <laughs> Dear Pastor, please pray for all the airline pilots. I'm flying to California tomorrow. Dear Pastor, I hope to go to heaven someday, but later than sooner. Dear Pastor, please say a prayer for our Little League team. We need God's help for a new pitcher. Dear Pastor, my father said I should learn the Ten Commandments, but I don't think I want to because we have enough rules already in my house. Dear Pastor, who does God pray to? Is there a God for God? Dear Pastor, are there any devils on earth? I think there may be one in my class, Carla. <laughs> Dear Pastor, how does God know good people from bad people? Do you tell him, or does he read about it in the newspaper? <laughs> this is some wisdom from children. Patrick, age 10, said, never trust a dog to watch your food. <laughs> Michael, 14, said, when your dad is mad and asks you, do I look stupid, don't answer him. <laughs> Michael said, never tell your mom her diet's not working. Susie, age nine, said, never hold a dust buster and a cat at the same time. <laughs> Naomi, 15, said, if you want a kitten, start out by asking for a horse. <laughs> Warren, age nine, said, felt markers are not good to use as lipstick. Joel, 10 years old, said, don't pick on your sister when she's holding a baseball bat. Oh, yeah. Last one. Ellen, age eight, said, never try to baptize a cat. <laughs> That's right. Oh me, oh my. Amen. For those that came in late, we're having a birthday dinner for yours truly after services, so please come back and be a part of it if you can. Amen? Amen. Acts Good. chapter 12, we're going to begin at verse 17. I'm going to read this to you from the Living Translation. So about that time, King Herod moved against some of the believers and killed the apostle James, John's brother. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish leaders, he arrested Peter during the Passover celebration and imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of 16 soldiers. Herod's intention was to deliver Peter to the Jews for execution after the Passover. But earnest prayer, say earnest prayer, earnest prayer, was going up to God from the church for his safety all the time he was in prison. The night before he was to be executed, he was asleep double chain between two soldiers with others standing guard before the prison gate. When suddenly there was a light in the cell and an angel of the Lord stood beside Peter. Then the angel slapped him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. Then the angel told him, Get dressed and put on your shoes. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me. The angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel. But all the time he thought it was a dream or a vision and didn't believe it was really happening. They passed the first and the second cell blocks and came to the iron gate to the street. And this opened to them to its own accord. 
So they passed through and walked along together for a block, and then an angel left him. But Peter finally realized what had happened. It's really true, he said to himself. The Lord has sent his angel to save me from Herod and from the Jews, what the Jews were hoping to do to me. After a little thought, he went to the home of Mary, mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for a prayer meeting. He knocked on the, at the door of the gate, and a girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back in to tell everyone that Peter was standing outside in the street. They didn't believe her. You're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. They must have killed him. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. When they finally went out and opened the door, their, to their surprise, knew no bounds. He motioned for them to quiet down and told them what had happened and how the Lord had brought him out of jail. Tell James and the others what happened, he said, and he left for safer quarters. At dawn, the jail was in great commotion. What had happened to Peter when Herod sent for him and found that he wasn't there? He had the 16 guards arrested, court martialed, and sentenced to death. Afterwards, he left to live in Caesarea for a little while. Church, I want to continue talking to you this morning about prayer. And we talked about it last week. And I shared a prayer with you, which I believe is very important to be prayed this time. And I believe prayer is one of the most important things that we can do in the world that we're living in today, church. And if we don't pray, who's going to do it? And then we, we went to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 last week. We said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Church, our land, your land, your body, your home, your family, the country we live in, that's our land. And he says that we'll do this, that we'll humble ourselves. Seek his face, not his hand, but seek his face. Turn from our wicked way. He says he will heal our land. You want your land to change, and there's something you and I have got to do about it. Amen? Amen. Amen? And today I want to continue talking to you about prayer. I want to talk about some prayer in the church and, and how they got results, church. Because, listen, so many times we're begging God. Oh, God, please do this. God, please do that. You get nowhere moving. You won't move God by begging God. Faith is what moves God. Church. Faith is what releases all the promises and all the blessings that God has for us is our faith. That's the key to open the door. Amen? Amen. A bus driver and a minister were standing in line to get into heaven. And the bus driver approached the gate and St. Peter said, Welcome. I understand you were a bus driver. Since I'm in charge of housing, I believe I found the perfect place for you. See that mansion over the hilltop? That's yours. The minister heard all this. He began to stand a little taller and said to himself, if a bus driver can get a place like that, just think what I'm going to get. The minister approached the gate and St. Peter said, welcome. I understand you were a minister. See that shack over there in the valley? St. Peter had hardly gotten the words out of his mouth when the shock minister said, I was a minister. I preached the gospel. I helped teach people about God. Why does a bus driver get a mansion and I get a shack? Sadly, St. Peter responded, well, it seems when you preach, people slept. When the bus driver drove, people prayed. <laughs> Listen, the pagans of Jesus' day were known for babbling on and on with the understanding that the more <coughs> words they used, the more the words they used in prayer, the more effective the prayer is. But Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 says, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think that will be heard because of their many words. It's not how many words you say, church. It's not even how much scripture you say. It's how much you believe what you're saying. Amen. 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 And when you're praying to God, don't pray the problem. Pray the solution. Amen. God already knows the problem. Amen. Amen. Start saying and getting agreement with God. If you've got a problem with your finances, find your scriptures on finances. If you've got a problem with healing, find your scriptures on healing. If you're having a relationship problem, find your scriptures on relationship. Yeah. And begin to confess those scriptures back to God. Faith cometh by hearing and by hearing the word of God. Amen? Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Matthew 6, 6 says that when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen, then your Father who sees if what is done in secret will reward you. Amen. He said, get alone. 
Get away from everybody. How many times have you decided you're going to pray and you're going to shut yourself off and the phone rings? Or somebody shows up at the front door. Or something happens. The devil will try to do everything he can to distract you. You've got to discipline yourself. You've got to be committed to this. Amen? He said, when you get a car, listen, when you get a car from somebody in the mail, what matters most to you? The professional poem written by a professional or the hand scribbled note at the bottom written by your friend? Right. Amen. For most of us, it's not the professional poem, it's the handwritten note at the bottom yes. because it's an intimate expression from someone who cares about it. Amen. Yes. Prayer is not to be ritual, ritualistic, church. You don't keep saying the same words over and over. It's to be a genuine expression of the soul. Amen. It's a personal conversation with a heavenly Father. Amen? Yes. F.B. Meyer, the author of a great little book called The Secret of God, said, The great tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but an unoffered prayer. Come on. Instead of it being something we do every day, like breathing, eating, walking, and talking, it seems to have become like that glass covered box on the wall that says, Break in case of emergency. And it's true that so, so very often, church, we associate prayer with crisis. Amen. You don't have to wait for a crisis no. to come to pray. You should be praying, maybe head off some of the crises that are coming to your life. Yes. Amen. Amen. Prayer, for the most part, is an untapped resource. It is talked about more than anything else and practiced less than anything else. And yet, for the believer, it's probably one of the greatest gifts outside of salvation that God has given us. You and I have the privilege and the right to come and talk to Almighty God. Yeah. Listen, they didn't have that in the Old Testament yes. church. Only the, only the high priest could go in and talk on behalf of the people. Well, listen, we don't have to worry about that no more. Jesus gave us access and we can come. The Bible said we can come boldly. We don't go, oh, Daddy God, here I am again. <laughs> no. Daddy God, here I am again. I'm your mess, and I'm back again. I'm going to the right place to get help. Amen. This is when you rather your kids come to you than go to somebody else. And they need help. Well, God wants you to come to him. And when I say, when we get in trouble, we run from him instead of running to him. Amen. And my thing is, we're so crazy. Where are you going to hide from God? No matter how high you go or how low you go, you can't hide from him. Amen? In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Listen, there are times when we as Christians should be praying in solitude. Amen? And as a family. But today I want to talk to you about those times that we should be praying together as a church. Amen. Maybe it's praying in small groups. I thank God for our intercessors. They're faithful. They come and they pray and they intercede for us. Now, I want to look at some examples of prayer in the early church. In each instance, I want you to notice which request was made of God and how he specifically answered your prayer. And hopefully that will motivate you and I to pray more frequent, more meaningful, and more intense prayer. The first instance I want to look at is According to Acts chapter 1, after Jesus ascended, he gave his disciples instruction to go to Jerusalem to stay in the city until they received the power of the Holy Spirit. Now listen, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon an individual to accomplish what God wanted him to accomplish. But they did not have the Holy Spirit in them like you and I do. The Holy Spirit would come, do what he's supposed to do, and then it would lift from them. You and I have the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, everywhere we go, church. Yes. And the Bible says he's trying to lead us and guide us in the truth. Sometimes we don't want to hear the truth. I preached a couple of weeks ago. You know, you'll know the truth, but sometimes it's going to hurt you before it makes you free. Sometimes we don't want to hear the truth, do we? Amen. Amen. In Luke 24, verse 49, it says, I'm going to send you what my father had promised, to stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. So in Acts chapter 1, we find the disciples in the upper room in constant prayer, praying for the power from on high that Jesus spoke of. This is a prayer, and we find the answer in chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, 
And you can write these scriptures down because I'm going to go to a lot of places. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4 says, And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each other. All of them were filled with the Holy Ghost and began speaking other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Listen, a lot of your denominational churches are going to tell you that the gift of speaking in tongues, the gifts of the Spirit, signs and wonders and miracles all ended when the disciples died. That's not for the death. But if you go to Mark chapter 16, it says, and these signs shall follow the believers. Amen. Amen. These signs shall follow the believers. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall lay hands on the sick. They shall, if they drink anything dead, they won't hurt them. Listen, these signs shall follow. We still have these signs. We still believe in speaking in tongues. We still believe in miracles. We still believe in healing. Amen? Amen. Oh, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. We may change, but he doesn't change. You know In Acts chapter 2, verse 7, says, Oh, we amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galilean? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Here they, they got filled with the Holy Ghost Church, and they began to speak with other languages, other tongues. And they were all from Galilee. And these other people were hearing them speak in their language. Listen, some missionaries have had to go overseas before and not know how to speak the language of the people. But when they began to preach, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit kicked in and they began to speak in a language that the people could understand. Yes. Amen. 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 As a church, church, we need to be praying that God will continue to anoint our ministry with the power of the Holy Spirit. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, church, we can do nothing. No. We can we can stay up here and, and do all go through all the motions, but it's going to be pointless. It's the Holy Spirit that makes everything come alive. It's the when, even when God spoke, He said, "Let there be." What happened? The Holy Spirit moved and created. We need the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, you're going to have a dead, dry church. Amen. We can sing beautiful songs, we can play beautiful music, but it's still going to be a dead, dry church. Amen. Amen. And listen, to have the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, there's usually two qualifiers for the anointing. One, it depends on obedience. In 1 Samuel 16, it says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, an evil spirit of the Lord tormented him, because he walked in continual disobedience with the Lord. Listen, just because God blesses a place, a minister, or a work of God for a certain time, doesn't mean he always will. The more God's people walk in obedience, the more the Spirit of God can flow. And that's why it's so important to live out our faith one day at a time. If we walk in disobedience, we are going to grieve and quench the Holy Spirit. He's not going to be able to do what He wants to do in our lives. But when you're obedient to God, then the Spirit has a free reign in your life to do all that He wants to do. Sometimes we forget and we take it for granted. We forget that we have God inside of us in the form of the Holy Spirit. And we have, that we're just orphans like we're out here doing it. That song we sang a while ago, I'm not fighting this thing alone. I'm, you're not in this thing alone. I'm not in this thing alone. God is with us wherever we go. And no matter what you go through, he's right there with you. And he will carry you through it and show you how to overcome it if we will allow him to do so. Yes. Amen. Yes. Church, also, I'm thankful for all the people in this church who lift me up on a daily basis in prayer. And it's good to know that when I approach this platform, that some of you are praying, Lord, anoint him in your Holy Spirit to preach your word in power and in truth. I appreciate that. I feel that. I know when you're praying, it makes a difference. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's the anointing. It's God's power. God's power that sets us free, that delivers us, that breaks the chains in our life. Amen? Amen. Matthew 7, verse 9, 11 says, Which of you, the son asked for bread, will give you a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though, you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Listen, 
So many times I've heard people, well, you know, I want to make sure I don't get a demon or I don't get a, a foul spirit. He just said, if you're asking God for something, you think God's going to give you something negative? God's going to give you what you're asking for if you're sincere. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, God wants you filled. He wants yeah, you in power. Yeah, yeah. Amen? Amen? Many times our problem isn't that we're not praying. Our problem is we aren't asking God for specific things. Yeah. Listen, if you're praying for finances and you say, Lord, I just need you bless my finances, how are you going to know if you really bless your finances? But if you're specific, Lord, I need a hundred dollars by the end of this day. Somebody shows you up, God uses them to give you a hundred dollars, you're gonna know that God gave you a hundred dollars. I heard don't do this, but I've heard women pray for a husband. Oh Lord, just send me a husband. Well, how are you gonna know if he's the one if you don't you're not specific? I want him to be a five to six feet tall, I want him dark hair, blue eyes. Then he shows up, my ah, gosh, you sent me my husband. Are you hearing what I'm saying, church? Be specific when you pray. Hallelujah. Have you ever heard of George Mueller? One day he looked down the streets of Bristol, England, and he saw hundreds of homeless children. And he was so moved with concern for them that he decided that something had to be done. He had only two, two pennies in his pocket. But he decided to start an orphanage. In 60 years, beginning with two pennies, George Mueller took care of 10,000 orphans. He looked out and saw homeless kids. And he could have said, but I don't have any money. There's no way to care for them. No way to meet their needs. No way to buy food. Instead, he looked at them. He said, therefore, I will reach out and help them. And God blessed his efforts mightily. Hallelujah. He kept a record of his prayer. And his prayer record was filled with more than 3,000 pages. His notes showed that more than 30,000 prayers were answered. Church, somebody go, you need to journal. When you're praying about something God answered, you need to write it down. So when you're discouraged, go back and look. You know what? I was in that situation and look what God did. Amen. 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 He said one night there was no food in the ark to give the children for breakfast. But at 3 o'clock in the morning, a baker called him up and said, I just can't sleep. I'm going down to the bakery to make some bread. Would it be all right to bring some bread home to you this morning? Amen. One time a milk truck just happened to break down in front of the orphanage. On a day when they had no milk, the truck driver came in and said, This milk dog on the spoil, would you like to have some of it? And that met their need. Time and time again, 30,000 times in 60 years, God answered to what you Think about it. In Acts 2 44, it says, When they heard this, they raised their voices together and prayed to God. We tend to pray more fervently when we're threatened by some kind of pressure. Why don't we wait till our back's up against the wall? Why don't we wait till the devil's after us or till we feel pressure before we pray? Why don't we pray to God first? Why is it, well, I've done everything else, I guess, let's, let's just pray about it. Like, that's no big deal. Pray about it should be a big deal, amen? Yeah, yeah. Three ministers were talking about prayer in general and the appropriate and effective position for prayer. As they were talking, a telephone was coming on the working on phone system in the background. One minister shared that he felt the key was in the, in the hands. He always held his hands together and pointed them upward toward a heaven as, a, as a, a form of symbolic worship. The second suggested that real prayer was conducted on your knees. The third suggested they both had it wrong. The only position worth the salt was to pray while stretched out flat on your face. By this time, the phone man could say out the conversation. He interjected, I found that the most powerful prayer I ever made was while I was dangling upside down by my heels from a power pole suspending 40 feet above the ground. <laughs> well, you'll get some serious earnest about praying in, won't you? What did the early church pray for? You think they prayed for Satan from persecution. That's what they prayed for. They prayed for boldness. Acts 4 29, the Lord considered the threats and able to servants to speak your word with great boldness. Hallelujah. And their prayer was answered. Acts 4 it says, and they, after they played, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. Why is it when we're in the world, we don't mind being bold? Uh -huh. When we're in the world, we just say what we thought. Yeah. But we become Christians and we become so meek and humble. Listen. What you say may change someone's 
eternal destiny. Yes, yes. Think about that. When you get to heaven and somebody runs up and throws their arms around your neck and says, thank God that you didn't worry about hurting my feelings, but you shared the truth with me, and I'm here today because you shared that truth. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Like I said, sometimes we don't want to hear the truth, but it's the truth that's going to make us free, church. And if you really love somebody, you're going to tell them the truth. Amen. It says they labor together, and the place, could you imagine, you wouldn't have to invite people to church if we get one mile, one accord, and begin to pray like they pray, and this building begin to shake, and all of a sudden it was on Channel 6 News, and it's in the Temple Daily Telegram. There's a whole lot of shaking going on in New Life Fellowship. Amen. Yeah. One of the things that we need to pray for as a church is courage. Yeah. We in the United States are threatened. With a, we're not a threat with arrest or imprisonment, but sometimes we get this politically incorrect label or we may get a lawsuit. The church, we still need to call sin, sin. We don't call it morally challenged. Listen, and when you're calling sin, sin, don't be obnoxious. You run up to your family and holler, repent, you're going to hell. You're always going to just scare the daylights out of you. No, when you speak the truth, speak it in love. Let them people know, I love you enough to tell you the truth. Amen. Listen, don't do it for the arrogant. I'm just a good Christian. I'm going to tell you, if you don't do this, you No. Oh, I was you, and I would be you if somebody hadn't come and told me the truth. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 6, 19 says, pray for me and ask God to give me the right words as I boldly tell others about the Lord as I explain to them that his salvation is for the Gentiles too. I don't know about you, but I think the ACLU has had way too much sway in our Christian lives. There was one group in Kentucky, they were graduating seniors, and they were told they couldn't mention God or they couldn't pray. That's here in America, church. The country was founded on God. Amen? Amen. Now listen, we need to pray for our Christian athletes. We need to pray for our political leaders. We need to pray for our entertainers. We need to pray that they begin to see the truth like you and I see the truth. Sir. Because the Bible says that the God of this world has them blinded. We pray that God, that God will remove those blinders off their eyes and off their hearts. And they begin to see the truth for what it really is. Amen? As the word spread, the word of God spread, the number of disciples of Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Think about that. These are priests. These are religious people. What changed them? What caused them to change? The word of God. Amen. We talked about this morning. Listen, don't get in an argument with someone over the Bible. The Bible says you get into arguments and stuff like that, all it's going to do is gender more strife. Don't get in an argument with someone. Tell them what you believe. Tell them the truth. Then walk away in love. And don't stand there and argue the Bible. That's exactly what the devil wants you to do. Amen. 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 God answered, and the early church grew, church. And we, we need to pray for our Sunday school teachers. We need to pray for our deacons. We need to pray for the choir. We need to pray for the praise band. We need to pray for everybody that's involved in ministry in this church. Amen. Every one of us, we're an ambassador for Christ. We're an ambassador for New Life Fellowship. Amen. Amen. And we need to pray for one another. Lift one another up. You know, there's times that people come to this, somebody that God will lay somebody on my heart or my mind. I just stop and begin to pray for them. I don't have to know what's going on in my life. God knows what's going on, but he wants someone to pray. He wants someone to pray for him and, and lift them up before the throne. Amen? Amen. 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 Acts 12 again. It says about that time, I'm almost through, but I lost my thought. It says about that time, King here arrested some who belonged to the church and tended to persecute him. And he had James, the brother John, put to death with the sword. When he saw this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter. And this happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. 
and Herod intended to bring him out for fully trial after the Passover. Here was Peter kept in prison. And here we have the church over here, and they were praying, and they were praying very earnestly. Not before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains. Sentry stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared as light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Listen, this is a man fixing to face death, and he's asleep. That's the peace of God. Amen. That's the peace of God. He's asleep. He's not worried about it. The angel had to slap him to wake him up. Most of us, we'd be running, walking this hill. Oh, God, what you going to do? Oh, God, what you going to do? When are you going to get me out of this? Why did this happen? We'd wear, we'd wear the place out just walking in circles, crying and complaining, and murmuring to God. But that's not what he's doing. He fell asleep. He was trusting God. And you're really trusting God. There's no reason to fear. There's no reason to worry. Amen. There's time just to have some peace. Amen. Yes. And he said, he struck Peter and told him to get up and wake up. The chains fell off. Amen. Listen. Whatever your bondage is, whatever your prison is, if you'll trust God, he will set you free. There's some of us in here, we've been, we've been bondage for years and years and years. And we tried everything we could to get free, and we couldn't get free. And maybe we got free for a little while, but we didn't stay free. Listen, the only way you're ever going to get really free is when you really come to the cross, come to the altar, lay it down, give it to Christ, put it in His hand, trust Him to deliver you and set you free from it. And when you do that, you what? All of a sudden, something spiritually is going to snap, something's going to happen, and these things are going to begin to fall off, and that bondage is not going to mean what it meant to you. And once you experience that freedom, you ain't ever going to want to go back into that bondage. Amen? Yeah. It says, he told him to put on his clothes and put his sandals. And then said, the angel left him. And he said, I know the Lord sent this angel. And he went down to Mary's house, the mother of John. And here the church is praying. And he goes up and he knocks on that door. A little girl comes up to the door. It's Peter. And she runs back to tell the church, it's Peter, the one you've been praying for. God answered your prayer. Here he is. And what did the church say? Listen, I hope y'all have a little more faith than what they did when you prayed for me. Okay. The church said, it must be his ghost. They must have killed him. <laughs> yeah. Duh, he just got. In church, we laughed at him, but we did the same thing. Amen. We'll pray, oh Lord, to do this. We'll fill the mighty power of God, we'll the doors, and negative stuff will come out of our mouth. Amen. And we just destroyed our prayer. Amen. Amen. But they came and they saw, and Peter began to tell them what happened. Listen, when you're praying, you're supposed to be believing. Amen. Not when you get it. It takes no faith when you got a church. It takes faith. He said, now faith is the substance of things not seen. Yes, man. Amen? Amen? It's the proof and the evidence of things we can't see. I can't see it, but God promised it, and God's promises is real. He does not. He's only not a man that should lie. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Amen. Peter kept on knocking, and they finally come to the door, and he told the story. There was a missionary lady, I want y'all to listen to this story. There was a missionary lady. She said, one night I had worked hard to help a mother in a labor war, but in spite of all we could do, she died, leaving us with a premature baby, a crying, and a crying two-year-old daughter. We would have difficulty keeping the baby alive as we had no incubator. We had no electricity to run an incubator. And no special feeding abilities. And although we lived on the equator, nights were often chilly. One student midwife went to the box we had for such babies, and the cotton wool the baby would be wrapped in. Another went to soak up the fire and fill a hot water bottle. She came back shortly in distress to tell me that in filling the bottle, it had burst. Rubber perishes easily, easily in tropical climates. And it was our last hot water bottle. As in the West, it is no good crying over spilled milk. So in that Central Africa, it may be considered no good crying over a burst water bottle. They don't grow on trees. There was no drugstore. 
them to go to. All right, I said, put the baby as near the fire as you safely can. Sleep between the baby and the door to keep it free from draft. Your job is to keep the baby warm. Following the following noon, as I did most days, I went to have prayer with any of the orphan's children who chose to gather with me. I gave the youngsters various suggestions of many things to pray about and told them about the baby. I explained their problem about keeping the baby warm enough, mentioned in a hot water bottle. The baby could easily die if it got chills. I also got them. Uh, I also told them of a two-year-old sister crying because her mother had died. During the prayer time, won't you listen? One ten-year-old girl grew pray with the usual blunt consciousness of an African child. Please, God, she prayed, send us a water bottle. It'll be no good tomorrow, God, as the baby will be dead, so please send it this afternoon. While I gasped inwardly at the audacity of the prayer, she added the follow way, and while you're about it, would you please send a dolly to the little girl so she'll know you really love her? As often with children's prayers, I was put on the spot. Could I honestly say amen? I just did not believe that God could do this. Oh, yes, I know that he can do everything. The Bible says so. But there are limits, aren't there? The only way God could answer this particular prayer would be sending me a parcel from the homeland. I had been in Africa for almost four years at that time, and I never, ever received a parcel from home. If anyone did send me a parcel, who would put in a hot water bottle when you live in the equator? Halfway through the afternoon, while I was teaching the nurses' training school, the message was sent that there was a car at my front door. By the time I reached home, the car had gone, but on the veranda was a large 22-pound parcel. I felt tears pricking my eyes. I could not open the parcel alone, so I sent for the orphanage children. Together, we pulled off the string. We folded the paper, taking care not to tear it. Excitement was mounting. Some 30 or 40 pair of eyes were focusing on this large cardboard box. From the top, I lifted out a brightly covered knitted jerseys, and eyes sparkled as I pulled them out. Then there were knitted bandages for the leprosy patient, and the children looked a little bored. Then came a box of mixed raisins and sultanas. That would make a nice batch of buns for the weekend. Then I put my hand in again, and I felt, could it really be? I grasped it, and I pulled it out. A brand new rubber hot water bottle. I cried. I had not asked God to send it. I had not truly believed that he could. Ruth, the little girl, was in the front row of the children. She rushed forward, crying. If God has sent the bottle, if he sent the bottle, he must have sent the dolly, too. Rummaging down to the bottom of the box, she pulled out this small, beautiful dressed dolly, and her eyes shone. She had never doubted. Childlike faith. Amen. Amen. Looking up at me, she said, Can I go over with you, Mommy, and give this dolly to that little girl so she'll know that Jesus really loves her? This parcel had been on the way for five whole months, packed by a former Sunday school class whose leader had heard and obeyed God's prompting to send a hot water bottle even to the equator. And one of the girls had put in a dollar for an African child five months before in answer to a believing prayer of a 10-year-old who said, bring it this afternoon. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God some prayer. I've got about 10 minutes. I'm going to read you one more story, and I'll promise I'll close. Tony Campola, a Baptist minister, who was invited to speak at the college in Valley Forge, Tennessee. He drove to the college, and where he spoke, several men took him to the back room and began to pray for him, that God would use his speech. And all these men were praying. One man just got off the cuff, began saying, Lord, about Bert Harris, Lord. Bert Harris needs you really bad because he lives in that trailer down the street, and he's considered leaving his wife and family. And Lord, if you could just get through to Bert Harris, that would be great. And then he went on with his prayer. Campola thought that was strange that he was saying that he would pray that here. He went out and he spoke and finished his message and he got in his car and he was driving home. And he picked up a hitchhiker. And he said he knew that he wasn't supposed to pick up a hitchhiker. But he thought, being a preacher, anytime I can get a captive audience, I'm going to take advantage of it. So he gets this guy in the car and he's talking to him. And he says, by the way, what's your name? The man said, Bert Harris. Campola stopped the car, turned it around, and immediately headed the opposite direction. The man looked at him and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm taking you back to your wife and family who you're trying to leave. The man went white. He never said another word. He sat there speechless, and Campola drove him straight to the, his trailer house. 
And the guy said, how did you know where I live? And Apollos said, God told me. And Apollos said, I took this guy inside his home, and my family and my marriage were restored, and God did an exciting thing. Never limit God. The only limit on God is, is what we demand in Him. He can do anything at any time for anybody. Just take the limit off. Quit looking in a box. Start believing for bigger things. Start believing for things that when it happens, you know that nobody but God could have done this for you. Amen? Amen? Come on, give God some more praise. Let's move on. Listen, we're going to play a song. The altar is open. If you need to come to the altar and make peace with God about something, please come. And after that, we're going to have a, a, an altar call, church, and we'll pray for anybody that's not saved. And then we're going to have corporate prayer because we're having a dinner in the back. Please come back. Church and take some ice cream. Whatever else they got back. They wouldn't let me go back there, so I don't know what I'm back. Okay. Come on back. And let's just have a good time. Amen. Listen to the words of this song. Let the Holy Spirit minister to you as only He can do. Amen. Go ahead, guys. <laughs>